wonderful historic property in Wilmington, where, uh, of course, my grandfather painted for over 60 years. And uh, uh, it's where I go every day. And this is the reason why, is when I walk into the studio, on the right, you'll see the studio today. But on the left, you will see what the studio looked like in 1910. And you'll notice that the secretary, the Georgia Plantation Secretary, is still there after 110 years. Mm. Um, and at the bottom, a more dramatic pano photograph of the studio um, from uh, left to right as it looks uh, when you walk in. So uh, uh, it's absolutely wonderful the studio is still here today. Um, so on the granddad's uh, photography project we started three years ago, after the uh, publication, the catalog Raisin A, realizing how much photography archive was at the Delaware Art Museum. And it just seemed appropriate to bring this whole um, body of work to the forefront. And you'll hopefully understand why uh, as we go uh, through the scrolling. This camera he bought, we have diary notations in 1902, a three and a quarter, four and a quarter Eastman Kodak camera. And uh, this is what he used for glass plate negatives and actually for a film, uh, film that he sent to uh, Eastman Kodak in Philly to have processed or he did it himself in the studio. Rachel got it. A little jump on me on the tabs that are really extraordinary in these boxes, but you'll see the handwriting at the bottom, Blackfoot Reservation, and scrolling up to the top, uh, grandfather's organization of these uh, prints that I think Rachel said number over 6,000. Now, while we're saying that, the negatives, which have been archived at Hagley Museum, fortunately, number about 4,500. And that uh, information is available on the Hagley website. So, let's see. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, that's funny. So here we begin Frank Tunover through his own lens, uh, the Silk Mill Girls detail. In the lower right, you'll notice that says L3, number one. Well, just like my grandfather's day books, he actually alphanumeric recorded every photographic print for almost everyone. So in those boxes with those tabs, every print has an alphanumeric uh, notation on, allowing us again to do um, research as far as where, when, um, and and why, for especially when he was illustrating his stories. Uh, Bill, I'm going to let Bill read this because uh, he's kind of the scholar on this project. So, Bill, if you read that for me. One of the things that we realized quite by accident you might call it a eureka moment was that when and of course john is most familiar with the body of work in the photography collection than the rest of us but we realized that there's an interesting twist here with frank schoonover's body of work in photography and that we could actually make an argument and we feel quite strongly we can defend that argument that Frank Schoonover, and I like to refer to him simply by his initials, FES, is, was really an important social documentary photographer in the early to mid 20th century. So what we did was we established a thesis, if you will, that says that, the, that we're hoping the book will establish FES as an important social documentary photographer in the 20th century. And it will also confirm 
his inclusion in the canon of great American photographers whose pictures include a broad spectrum of life in North America and Europe. An underlying theme will address his work as an illustrator and the influence of photography on his compositional work. Uh, when, we, when we began our work, we established a tentative or a working table of contents, which is still going through revision as we continue through the project. And there are two, there are four parts to the, uh, to the, to the book right now. Uh, John's showing you the, uh, uh, the, the, the format. Uh, the first part, essentially, do you want me to go on? Or do yep, you want to finish through this. Yep. Okay. Uh, the first part basically would include an essay from John, more of a personal uh, tribute to his grandfather uh, as grandson and as an observer of FES's photography. There would be a second essay that would establish, in effect, the parameters to evaluate or to establish FES as an important social documentary photographer. And that would simply be an examination of the artist and the photographic medium. It would be more of a generic uh, scholarly, if you will, presentation. The okay. second part and the third part contains a series of chapters. And what we decided to do was list the chapters by, by, by the chronological order in which the photographs were actually taken. We did that for a couple of reasons. One reason was we want this book clearly to be a complementary publication to the catalog resume. Those of you who have seen the resume or have become familiar with it know that it is an extensive, incredibly extensive accumulation of the illustrations, the, uh, the stained glass and the, the, the Christmas cards and everything else that, that FES did over his, his enormous career. So we wanted the outline to be consistent with the chronology that the, the resume established. Uh, so the second part, basically talks about uh, photographic field trips that he took. Now, keep in mind that, and here's another little twist that we, we decided was important. In his photographing, FES really was doing ethnography. He was studying people, places in their environment, and he was through the visual medium of photography, actually creating, if you will, a visual ethnographic narrative. He, had, he probably never even knew what ethnography was. That's not important. What's important is what he produced. So what we've done is we've focused in on a number of uh, uh, subjects which clearly can demonstrate that he really made a contribution to visual ethnography, if you will. And the final part is simply an assessment, bringing everything together to talk about FES as a social documentary photographer. So that's basically the outline of the book. And again, the, you know, the, the, the contents essentially are intact as the work was produced. There it is. So we're gonna just, thank you, they only go through, uh sort of chapter by chapter with a little um, addition of uh, historic photographs and then granddad's photographs and then uh, uh, talk about the relationship between his photography and his illustration, which is uh, what uh, chapter two is really all about. Here he is in the far left at uh, Drexel starting to be an illustrator under Howard Pyle and the, uh, his fellow students there in a bit of a, uh, a, a, a sort of a uh, uh, Beaux-Arts kind of presentation, um, followed by granddad still in Trenton commuting to Drexel um, every day for four years. Here he's uh, toasting, which is a toast uh, we feel to the book with his brother Labar, 1896. 
Now, we think somebody took this photograph with Granddad's camera. Now, note something I found in our research. Here are negative envelopes for photos of the YMCA in Trenton. So you can see the envelopes have these inscriptions of where he took each photograph and a description. So this allows us again to identify uh, these photographs in the very, very early days when it's evident that he was um, taking a lot of photographs um, before he even arrived in Wilmington. Uh, and here's one, Baptism in Delaware River, Trenton, New Jersey, 1899. Um, actually, as Bill was describing, a, an ethnographic photograph of a, um, a very interesting event on the river right near Trenton, New Jersey. So we know exactly when this photograph was taken. And transitioning May I ask really quickly before you go on, sorry to interrupt John, but we're getting some questions in the chat. Could you define how you're using the term ethno ethnographic? Oh, Bill. What we mean by ethnographic is uh, an assessment, an analysis based upon observation of people in their, in their living environment. Uh, and it encompasses all of the cultural, social activities of humankind. For example, uh, the picture that John just showed, the, the baptism in the river. Uh, it's an ethnographic presentation of, in, a, in this sense, a religious ceremony where people are gathered around watching the, uh, the baptismal take place. So the ethnography aspect is the actual observation. It also can include participation in the event itself. Of course, FES did not participate in the baptismal ceremony. He simply recorded it visually through the photography. Does that help? Thank you. Okay, and Bill, I should have mentioned, uh, Grant, I did a charcoal of that event and presented it to Howard Pyle as one of his weekly compositions. <laughs> should have put that in there, I guess. Yeah. So here's a uh, granddad in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania, on the left, um, headed up there to um, photograph and sketch for the Breaker Boys story that he illustrated for McClure's. And on the right, here he is some 50 years later uh, in the studio. I just love this with his studio camera that, in fact, he never used. That was brought to the studios in somewhere around 1920 or 30 by gentlemen who never came back and got it. <laughs> and I think your grandfather's always been amused by the fact that uh, it uh, never left. It has been uh, loaned to the Biggs Museum in Dover um, at this point. So um, off to uh, Scranton in what begins really um, his really serious involvement in uh, social documentation and illustration. Um, and this is probably one of the most poignant photographs that he took while he spent several days uh, in the coal mines, uh, sketching, making notes, and taking these extraordinary photographs. Now, mind you, this is the Breaker Boys meeting What's even more remarkable about this is it was taken at night with a flash. And you can actually see that in the, uh, in the eyes of these young boys. John, can I just interject one yeah. point here? Because I, I think it's gotta be really made clear. Keep, everybody keep this in mind. Uh, FES, in my view, had no interest in social documentation per se. He was interested in gathering imagery mm -hmm that he would later use as source material for his illustrations and his paintings and his eventual, you know, the publication of many of those illustrations in magazines and, and other, uh, uh, other media. So I think that's a curious irony about the whole thing and uh, makes it even much more 
exciting and fascinating. Uh, absolutely, Bill. And of course, the, here is the charcoal drawing that is the result of uh, that photograph for the boys, um, Children of the Cold Shadow uh, in the story uh, by McClure's. Now, I've thrown this in because Lewis Hines is one of the best known social documentary muckraker photographs of the early 20th century. He took over 5,000 photographs, which are archived in, uh, this, in the Smithsonian. And uh, this is Breaker Boys at Work, South Pinston, Pennsylvania. But this photograph was taken 10 years after Hines, who was working for the National Child Labor uh, Commission, took this along with many, many others. And it's remarkably comparable to my grandfather's photographs of the same period. But Hines was a hired hand. Frank, as Bill has just discussed, it was just there to uh, do research. So off to New York uh, for the next story, Waves of the Street. Um, you can see the shoeshine boys on the left and on the right, the subsequent um, finished uh, charcoal and uh, crayon drawing that's at the uh, Biggs Museum in Dover. Uh, that is, you can see the similarity, the shoe box, slight change in composition, little addition of some fellows walking by. Um, and here are a couple of more photographs from that New York trip. Uh, the uh, uh, feeding of uh, the uh, soup station here, 1903, and then the, the newspaper boys, and there are also illustrations for that story. Uh, off to Hudson Bay, 1903, for a four month trip that was absolutely remarkable. Um, breaking trail, spending the night in his Wabino on the right. You can see the smoke coming out of the uh, stovepipe there. 30, 40 degree below zero weather. Uh, that's barely enough to keep you going. Sketch pad in his hand. And on the right, one of the remarkable hand colored lantern slides taken during that trip. Imagine again, it's 30 degrees below zero. There are more of the lantern slides. There are many more of the um, black and white prints, but we, are, we know that some of the lantern slides unfortunately have not been found, but that's one of the aspects of this project that we're uh, working on. Um, one, of the, one of the few groups of photographs we've not really tracked down. Um, back, uh, back to Canada again on the left, the finished charcoal and uh, wax crayon drawing. Wax crayons wouldn't freeze in Canada. On the right, mm -hmm. just a very soft, lovely photograph of a figure in the far background. And again, mind you, these are just reproduction scan from the original print that will be significant professional um, attention paid to both the, uh, the prints and the negatives at uh, Hagley. That'll be a joint uh, um, effort on behalf of uh, our research team and with help from, uh, from hopefully some other folks. Um, but here's uh, on to the American West, Butte, Montana. I know my sister Louise will be working on this chapter. She's fascinated by this. He went to Butte, Denver, and the Blackfoot Reservation. This is the copper mine, a remarkable overview of this industrial landscape, 1906. Here's what I think is in just a very, very wonderful photograph of these children on his way to Denver. And I think he took this photograph somewhere near the Juniata Railroad Station, which again has a wonderful perspective. And thank goodness the uh, train station has a sign on it. So 
we uh, we know right right where he was. Uh, on to the Blackfoot Reservation. This is a wonderful example of the use of his photography and then incorporating it into the actual cover of a book by James Willard Schultz, Plum the State the Snake Medicine. You can see how he relied on this, unlike some other uh, illustrators that we um, will bring into the discussion later on, including uh, Norman Rockwell, uh, who, who did a lot of photography, obviously, for his compositions. Uh, on to what a chapter I think is absolutely fascinating. Going to let Bill comment, but this is steerage on the Conang Louise um, immigrant ship, which came into New York in 1908. And I can tell you that not only do we know the name of the, the uh, ship through uh, a name on the lifeboat, we actually have the manifest and we know the names of all 406 immigrants on this boat. But Bill, a couple comments. Yeah, these are, these are immigrants. This was uh, during the, probably the, uh, the height of immigration from uh, Europe, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, most of these immigrants were from various countries. Uh, the, the, this, I think, is a, another great comparison of the photograph of a couple of the uh, people on, on, on board. Uh, upper deck, and then the uh, the actual uh, painting. What what was the medium, John? That's charcoal and wash. Charcoal and wash. Schoonover okay. red there. Schoonover red. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you talk about Schoonover red? Well, Schoonover red, you'll see it here very uh, dramatically as a color that he used almost from the beginning, even with Pyle, as kind of an accentuation of his uh, charcoal drawings, and then on into his. Uh, oil paintings again that red you will see as a very important pigment throughout his uh, career so we've uh, named it schoon over red and uh, there it is you must you must introduce and, the interloper oh, the interloper behind you us can see Fran my lovely wife has joined us I think she's in the shadows I back in. There. so being very quiet <laughs> and uh, lovely back there. <laughs> uh, on to Scranton, uh, the silk mills. Um, the two stories that he illustrated, Women in the Pennsylvania Silk Mills, again, kind of a, an exposure of the working conditions of the young women uh, whose silk mills were located generally um, very nearby uh, adjunct to the great coal mines in the Lackawanna Valley up near Scranton. And this is, again, in a remarkably poignant photograph of a young girl surrounded uh, by her uh, fellow children, boys and girls, in a sort of a light mood, uh, but it speaks to itself. Um, here are the uh, Women at the loom, the women outside of uh, the boarding house, and then two girls in the lower right inside the silk mills. Um, one of about 40 photographs in the collection. We're just giving you a few examples of these. And then, um, as Bill expressed, another wonderful. Uh, juxtaposition of the lunchtime on the fire escape. Actually had that charcoal and wash with a little slight touches of red hanging right behind us. And then the actual coal mine, as you can see that my grandfather incorporated into this composition. But the silk mill would have been um, actually within a mile of this great coal mine. Uh, whoops, back, 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 back. I think I, uh, oh, 
And here we are, a wonderful watercolor, uh, one of about nine he did for uh, this story, a moment of conversation, um, very soft, very feminine, and then again, with a little touch of the schoonover red. And this story wasn't as much of a hard, um, edgy statement about uh, child labor so much as it was just the working conditions um, of the women. And we'll discuss that in our, uh, in our book. Um, chapter eight, Cuba, Louisiana, Manila Village. This is where he went down, Bill, I think, uh, to uh, do a little research for Jean Lafitte the Pirate, although there are no photographs of Jean Lafitte the Pirate. He was long gone, but there, he uh, did um, illustrated a story of the uh, shrimp factory um, and went on to Cuba. So uh, this is the harbor at Manila. And I just put this photograph in uh, as just one example. But uh, I think, Bill, you're going to do Jean Lafitte the pirate. Yes. I'm going to dig him up. You better dig him up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, on to Canada, back to Canada in 1911, second trip in the summer. And this involves the Ojibwe Hudson Bay Company, as you'll see emblazoned on the stern of the canoe. And again, well, I think we're into um, both studies for his uh, compositions. And again, the ethnographic. Uh, photography, which uh, uh, makes such a remarkable statement at a very early um, time in the, uh, even in the Hudson Bay Company history. Again, remember, this is turn of the century, and Schoonover was one of the few people to travel up there to the extent that he did. Uh, here he is speaking with one of the Ojibwe chiefs on the left. And on the right, uh, the fur traders, uh, the final uh, product uh, in, uh, in a story that he actually wrote uh, for uh, Harper's Magazine. Do you know how old he was there, John? Uh, 1910, about uh, 33, 1877, 1910. There we go, about 33 years old. So part three, as Bill talked about, this part will go through several chapters and we're still uh, doing a lot of research on this. Unfortunately, with the museum having to be closed, our access to, to the uh, archives was, has been very limited, although Rachel, God bless her, has been building um, a database of scans uh, that we can refer to. But this is just one of uh, one of the photographs in Jamaica, a trip he took with Howard Pyle. This is, remember, 1906. So there'll be some pretty interesting photographs from that uh, series. Mount Pocono, uh, one of my favorites, only about seven photographs here. But mind you, in 1907, this was not your father's NASCAR. Uh, notice the decorum of the ladies. In the background, these old uh, automobiles, and there were only 30,000 automobiles in America at this point, uh, are speeding around the uh, dirt track. But the, the formality of this mm. is remarkable. And uh, there's a handful of more photographs that are even more defining. I'm doing research on the actual automobiles as we speak. Um, but in speaking of automobiles, on to Europe. Carol's going to do research on this. Uh, here we are, 1907, a rather extensive trip. There's a um, plethora, I should say, of uh, photographs of this that need to be identified and uh, discussed. But here is my grandfather in the back seat with, we think, Mrs. Sellers who with, his, uh, with her husband, Frank, um, sponsored this trip. And of course the chauffeur there, notice 
were in the Alps in uh, southern France and uh, got to find out what car that was. But we do know that it was shipped over to Europe and here is where they went. There's a map of Schoonover's travels all the way down through Florence, down to southern Italy, and all the way back. Again, this allows us to correlate the photographs, hopefully, since we know the time, with the actual venue. And I should add that many of these photographs speak to the architectural history of Europe, and we're going to bring that into the conversation also. So uh, back to Wilmington, <clears throat> wonderful group of photographs about one of my favorite uh, events, if you want to call it that, uh, things to do, the circus, Wilmington, Delaware. We actually have newspaper articles about the very day the circus came to town and here are the horses, the elephant. Now, my grandfather actually used this elephant in a later illustration, and we might bring that into the conversation, but just one, for one story only. So there was sort of a purpose, but uh, you'll see some more dramatic photographs of the tents being set up right here uh, in our backyard. Uh, on the beach haven, just a, uh, another uh, one shot presentation, but there are many more of Beach Haven 1912. But uh, again, architecturally interesting. Granddad went there and uh, did some sketching, uh, went there with the family. But there are quite a few photographs of the surrounding area, the docks and the, the ocean. And I think we'll, we'll keep chapter 14 in there. Back to Wilmington, the gypsies came to town. Again, we have notations in his diaries of this uh, visitation, if you want to call it that, of the gypsies in Claymont, Delaware. Um, ethnographic for sure. There'll be several more of these very interesting um, photographs of a way of life, if you want to call that, that probably just uh, sort of came and went uh, in this particular uh, few days, but um, I think you'll find these quite wonderful. Uh, back to Bill, Camp Savage, um, the outdoor adventures, that's actually adventures, that's actually my grandfather on the left and another photograph on the right of sort of the same camp, but Bill, uh, two stories that he illustrated. Yeah, he he was asked by he was asked by a magazine, uh, Outdoor World and Recreation, to write uh, an article in October, nineteen thirteen. Then a second article in December of the same year. And what he did was he actually wrote a what I think is is a very interesting narrative of the experiences of just a bunch of buddies. There were four of them all together, I think. A bunch of buddies going out into the wilderness, into the woods, camping, fishing, hunting, uh, schmoozing, you know, just enjoying themselves. And what FES did was write these two articles and illustrated them with photography, not mm -hmm. paintings or illustrations, but with this photography. And we found a whole collection of photographs that he that he took on these two trips and what i think is important about them is that first of all it demonstrates that fes really was a good writer mm -hmm. secondly he was a good observer he understood how the whole thing with nature worked the interaction between humankind and and nature itself and again keeping in mind that relative to everything about the whole career of FES. This was a totally minor experience, but I think it has significance, and, and John, I think you agree with this, that it has significance because it shows that he wrote and he photographed and he brought the two, the two abilities together to do some interesting ethnographic observations. 
And again, he was a participant in the whole camping experience. Thanks, Bill. Uh, finishing out with uh, uh, my grandfather's beloved Bushkill, um, where he had a, a summer home in 1914 and uh, spent a lot of his time starting with his youth there. And uh, I picked this photograph because of its artistic merit, which is another fact or factoid about his overall photography is the artistic merit to it. Some of these photographs just hold their own, no matter if you knew the story or where he was. Um, Bushkill Falls, right in the backyard. The stream actually came through his uh, home up there, which looked exactly like this until about 1967. Uh, actually 69 until unfortunately the Department of the Interior bulldozed it down to build a dam, a Tox Island dam, uh, that was never built. But that's a whole nother story. So we're gonna sort of pull together a lot of the Bushkill photographs over a span of uh, a few decades um, to uh, illustrate uh, his love of Bushkill and his uh, many photographs of that area. This is just above Stroudsburg for those uh, who want to Google it. Um, then part four, we're kind of obviously reaching the end of the book, uh, assessing Frankie Schoonover, social documentary photography. Bill, who's abandoned me for a minute, uh, will uh, pen that uh, uh, essay, and I think very astutely with his scholarship and Remember, Bill himself was a photographer. So this is the women in the silk mills, a charming, lighthearted, just interesting photograph, except for uh, the lady on the far right, who's not quite sure why granddad's taking this photograph. They're obviously sort of posed a bit, but, uh, but uh, with sort of a carefree, carefree moment. Uh, finishing again, um, or finally, I should say, uh, Frank and Martha Schoonover, Martha, his companion for forever, really. Um, about 1950 on a trip, probably up to New England, but notice uh, Granddad has his camera with him, as always, and um, it just bespeaks of a marvelous relationship uh, his good health uh, here still in 1950 and uh, I think a, a very wonderful way to end our presentation uh, but I do want to uh, uh, show you one more thing when we come back I want to show that to them uh, in a oh maybe we can do that now or well, whenever you want to do it so uh, I'll hold it up for you uh, so thank you all for uh, being part of the presentation I hope but You've uh, gleaned something from it, and we'll stick with us because we've got about another year. <laughs> George, I'm going to hold up the book that uh, I just uh, sent you a bill for. Um, <laughs> should I come back to the screen with us? Yes, please. Uh, should, we show this? should I stop share? Yeah. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is the book that just came in the mail, which is a uh, actually a shutterfly just a sample, and we'll turn it around, Bill, uh, just a sampling so we can show that to uh, uh, perspective, uh, uh, perhaps even uh, in fundraising and perspective uh, friends. Uh, it, uh, it just is sort of a 40 page uh, gathering of, of the chapters and uh, We'll give people a good idea of kind of what we what we're up to, so to speak. So uh, there it is in a nutshell, and we thank you again for for being part of this. Thank you both. If you um, take some questions, there have been some coming in from the chat. 
Uh, to start off, just a clarifying question some people have asked if his photographs ever were published or if they really were just personal source material. Well, uh, as Bill was explaining, they actually were uh, published for uh, the two stories he wrote about traveling, but um, the uh, Montana, Montana, Colorado trip, uh, those photographs, especially of a story about uh, a political a battle of the many Healy, um, the McClure's published, those photographs were used. And um, so there are several instances of his photographs um, being part of the text or, or part of the story. Thank you. And um, Sally, can I ask if you want to ask your question about steerage? I know you had a question earlier. Oh, I just was, I was curious that with the picture of the immigrant ship that uh, the first picture showed no women at all. And so was it, did there tend to be a lot more men on the manifest or were women just not allowed up on the deck with men? It was just a, a sort of a sociological, ethnographic question because the second one you showed women with their children, but the first one was solely men. And that was curious to me if it was an immigrant ship. Servant. Yeah, uh, I, I, we have enough photography from that, uh, from that, from that ship that FES took over several days, uh, that shows women and men were together. But what what happened was, and I think it was probably just a cultural thing, uh, the men would somewhat segregate themselves and do their own thing, and the women would, you know, do their own thing. Uh, but they they were all they were in effect all together on the same ship, yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, another question from Pam about um, the timing. Do you want to uh, voice your question, Pam? Sorry, I was on mute. I would just like to know, um, when did he stop painting or take photographs? When in his career, because it said that we showed 1950 and we show Bushkill like up through 1960. So, but he lived until 70. 1972, yeah. Um, good observation. Uh, he was still painting landscapes uh, up through the uh, early 1960s. And he was still taking photographs when he went up to Bushkill, uh, especially during the summer. Uh, there'll probably be fewer of those. Uh, relating to Bushkill in the early days, but his career was was uh, uh, very uh, active up through painting number two thousand five hundred and ten in nineteen sixty five. If my dates serve me correctly, you know one of the things that's a, that I think is astounding about FES is, and this was clearly demonstrated by the the catalog resume the man the man kept an extraordinary set of records uh he he documented he documented he recorded everything uh you know john earlier talked about the the, the recordings that he, the alphanumeric recordings that he made on on the individual photographs but all of his work you know who, who he painted it for or what the photograph was was about uh just amazing it's a researcher's gold mine any researcher who does any anything like this uh on a an artist or a non-artist uh would find that the the records that fes took were just extraordinary and just a wealth of great great information so if you need documentation you got it <laughs> And Bill, you're correct. The day books, which I didn't mention, from one to two thousand five hundred and ten, all by hand, every day, chronological, numerical, uh, simply amazing. And they are fortunately at the Delaware Art Museum. We're very fortunate. Everything's at the Delaware Art Museum, right, right behind my house. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Rachel, don't let them out of your sight. Yeah. <laughs> Another question coming from Judy now. Far away. I'm getting there. Um, many years ago, your sister talked about a 1955 Poconos when the great flood washed all the art out of the barn. And I was in the higher up in Bushkill during that summer flood. How many, do you know how much art was lost? Mm. Oh, I wish. It all uh, washed away. No, I, I wish uh, my sister, maybe she'll chime in. Um, yeah, 55, by the way, got photographs of that. Oh, uh, just saying. <laughs> but the, uh, I think the water came up um, several inches in the barn, which meant that all the paintings, which were just uh, propped up, uh, in that studio barn behind his wonderful house uh, in Bushkill got wet. I'm sure okay. quite a few did not survive. Not sure. Uh, I don't think, you know, say quite a few. I'm, I'm going to back off on that. Because I don't know, but... Several more effective. We have found paintings later on uh, during restoration even that exhibit the watermark hmm. on the back of the painting up hmm. two or three, four inches. Hmm. Uh, exactly. The fact that many uh, of thank you survive uh, is uh, very fortuitous. And who was Mrs. Shipley that sponsored? Mr. Sellers, rather, not Shipley. Sellers. Do you have any idea who sponsored his trip? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that was the Sellers family. who were a very prominent family. The Iron Works people. Yeah. And uh, in Wilmington, very good friends of, of my grandfather. A lot of references in his... Uh, Again, he, has, he also kept a diary. Um, and we have quite a few of those diaries. Uh, daily diary. And it refers to um, his comings and goings. Sellers families mentioned in there quite often. Yeah, related to and the rock. Family. Thank you. A, a very important painting, illustration of a grandfather. Thank you for that question. One more question coming from it's Doug. That's Doug. Go ahead. Yeah, I saw on your map of Europe where he was traveling, that he traveled on the way down from Venice to Florence. And I was just wondering, did he pass through Ferrara or Bologna on the way and take any pictures there? When we get back in the museum, <laughs> Fingers crossed, we'll find that out. But because uh, uh, Carol Schmiegel's doing a lot of that um, research for, uh, with us, and uh, let me write write that down, Bill. Will you? Uh, Bologna or Ferrara? F e r r a r a. Sorry, we're gonna. It's a very picturesque city, and it was actually on the grand tour of the 19th century. So, so many of the wealthy Americans who were doing the grand tour would stop by Ferrara for its uh, architectural uh, riches. And I just, I'd just be curious. I went there quite a lot on business. And if there were photographs that he took back when he was touring through there, I would love to uh, see them. Spell the name of the city again, please. F-E-R-R-A-R-A. And where is that, in Italy? Yes, it's between, it's about 30 miles north of Bologna. Uh, Doug, I really appreciate that because what we need to remember is 1907, he was taking numerous photographs of venues, sites, places before World War I or World War II. Mm. And I think that needs to be um, if we have time, it needs to be studied a bit, um, and perhaps the effect, uh, you know, yeah. of World War I on, the, on these. Ferrara is not a major city now because when they put the railroads in, it didn't turn out to be a big terminus, Padua, Bologna. But during the Renaissance, it had probably the third richest court in terms of art, music, and literature. Mm -hmm. So... That's part of what made it such a, a stop on the grand tour. Right. In fact, uh, you know, somewhere there may be some, uh, I haven't just thought of this, 
of Sellers family archives. Mm. Um, it just popped in my mind. Could even be at the Delaware Historical Society. There's a Bancroft uh, archives. Quite a few of those are uh, are at the uh, Historical Society. So you can see, work in progress. Yeah. Thank you. It makes it fascinating. Thank you so much to our speakers today. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, hey, listen, this is thank you. This is great fun. This may helps. This makes it worthwhile. We well, hope that everyone will join us next week for another art chat. Um, the link is in the chat. And thank you everyone for coming today. We thank you too. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks everybody. And